you very much. And thank you very much for this very kind invitation. It's my second time at TIMPA, and it's always great to be here. Um, so the topic of these three lectures, uh, so it's symplectic homology, and actually we will learn uh, uh, in, the next, uh, in the next hour what, what symplectic homology is in, uh, in Alex um, uh, lectures but for a particular kind of uh, manifold, of symplectic manifolds, namely cotangent bundles. Uh, so, and, and this because, so cotangent bundles are somehow important, well, first of all, the whole symplectic topology wants to be somehow a geometrization of mechanics, and cotangent bundles are phase space of uh, mechanical system, so that's, the, that's an obvious reason. Another reason is that uh, cotangent bundles are really ubiquitous in, uh, in symplectic topology because of the Weinstein uh, theorem. Every Lagrangian submanifold of a symplectic manifold has a neighborhood which is symplectomorphic to a neighborhood of the zero section of a cotangent bundle. And so if one knows um, well, we will see what this invariant is, this symplectic homology. If one knows the symplectic homology of cotangent bundle, one can, all, uh, one can often say a lot about uh, uh, um, uh, Lagrangian submanifolds. Okay, but let's start. And so I will start by recalling some, uh, uh, some simple facts about, do you read if I write here, if I start writing here? Maybe, maybe here. Okay, okay. So let's start with, say, Fenchel, Legendre, duality. Just to recall all the notations. So this is all uh, very classical things, but let me recall everything so that we also have, uh, we use also common notation. So. As I said, our symplectic manifold, our favorite symplectic manifold is the cotangent bundle of, uh, of some manifold M. So here M, M will always be a closed manifold. And its cotangent bundle is uh, equipped with a natural symplectic structure. So omega with the standard, will be the standard symplectic form on T star M. So this can be defined, for instance, uh, intrinsically. So this omega is, it's, it's actually an, an exact form. It's the differential of lambda, where lambda, so lambda at a point x evaluated uh, on a vector v. So this is in T star M. And this is in T x t star m. What you have to do is you have to take x. x is a one form. And so x wants to be evaluated onto a vector. And this vector is just, you take the differential of the projector. So pi is the projector from t star m into m. You differentiate it at x. You apply it to V, and what you get is a tangent vector. And then you apply this cotangent vector to this tangent vector, and this is duality. OK, so this, this defines lambda, this primitive. So it's called the Liouville form. It's a primitive of our symplectic form. And actually, local coordinates, omega is, well, let's start with lambda. Lambda is PDQ. So pj dqj, j from 1n, and omega, so it's dpj wedge dqj. OK, so this is our cotangent bundle. And uh, the next object which, are, which is interesting for us is the class of Tonelli Hamiltonians. So let's give a definition. So we will always deal with uh, time-dependent Hamiltonians. 
the Hamiltonians will depend explicitly on time in a periodic way. So our Hamiltonian is a function. So it's periodic in time. So t is always will always be r over z cross t star m. It's smooth and it's said to be Tonelli. It's Tonelli if Well, if it's fiber-wise convex, well, strictly convex, meaning that if I compute the second differential with the, I write it in this form, DPP, so the fiber-wise along fibers of this, uh, of the Hamiltonian at every t x, this is everywhere positive, the second differential. And then the second condition is superlinearity. Superlinearity, so meaning that the limit of H T Q P over P, this is plus infinity. This is the limit when P goes to infinity. Uh, this is the fiber-wise differential. So uh, th this function is defined on a on a vector bundle. T star m is a vector bundle. So you can uh, you can differentiate. Along, along the fibers twice. And uh, so this basically means that if you restrict your, your, your function to every fiber, this is a convex function in a, in a strict sense, meaning that its action is everywhere positive definite. Okay? So these are Tonelli, Tonelli Lagrangians. So convexity along, along the fibers and superlinearity. So in this condition of sublinearity, one uses a metric to make sense of this norm of p, but actually because of compactness, uh, the condition is independent on the metric. And uh, so Tonelli Lagrangians are, uh, Tonelli Hamiltonians, sorry, are important. This is the, these are the right assumptions uh, to deal with fenchel legend duality, namely, if we have such a Hamiltonian, then we have also its dual, its dual Lagrangian. This will be, so, uh, so the, the, so the dual Lagrangian, let's call it L. So this will be also smooth. It will also be time periodic but it will be defined on the tangent bundle of M. And th this is defined by the Fenchel transform. So L of T, Q, V. So here I will always denote points in T star M as Q, P. Q is a point in M and P is a covector. Instead, points in the tangent bundle as Q, V. Again, a point in M and a vector. So this is, it takes the maximum over all p's in t, q, star, m. And then I have duality, p, v, minus the Hamiltonian, h, t, q, p. Okay? This is called the Fenchel transform. And this actually defines a nice, uh, a nice smooth uh, function because of this convexity and superlinearity. This maximum is actually achieved at a unique point, and you can prove that this is ni a nice uh, smooth function. And uh, what is important is maybe the Fenchel inequality. So this Fenchel inequality says that L T Q V plus H T Q P is always greater or equal than P V. It actually follows quite easily from the definition. And, uh, and actually, equality holds if and only if 
uh, well, if V and P are related by the Legendre transform. So if and only if, for instance, P equals D V L T Q V. So also L is a function defined on a fiber bundle, on a vector bundle. So we can, do, if we differentiate it fiber-wise, this is defined, well defined, we don't need uh, anything to define this. And this is actually a covector, because this is a, a differential of a function on the tangent bundle. So this gives us a, a covector exactly like, like P. And this is actually equivalent to saying that V is instead is D P H. where this should be interpreted, this is a linear function on the cotangent, so on a dual space, but since the dual of the dual is canonically identified with the original space, this is a vector. So everything makes sense without identification. Okay, so this just means that this maximum is achieved exactly when we have either this inequality or uh, this equality or equivalently this, this equality. And actually, this defines, so this defines a diffeomorphism, so diffeomorphism. This diffeomorphism, let's call it L. It goes from, say, T cross Tm into T cross T star M. And it's defined exactly by this identity. So T Q V goes into T Q and as P we choose this D V L T Q V. So one can check that this is a diffeomorphism which preserves fibers between these two two manifolds. And in general, it, it will be nonlinear on the fibers. It, it's linear for particular Hamiltonians. When the Hamiltonian is a, it, it's exactly quadratic in the P's, then this will be uh, a, linear, a linear thing. And it's inverse, of course. So this is L, and L minus 1 is TQP goes into TQ DPH. Okay, and this is called uh, Legendre transform. Okay, and what is this good for? Uh, well, this relates the Hamiltonian formalism to the Lagrangian formalism, namely, when we have a Hamiltonian, then we have a vector field. So H induces a vector field xh, this is a vector field on t star m. And this is defined by, well, we saw it this morning. I will just uh, change sign. So omega of xh comma xi equals minus the differential of h applied to xi. And yeah, well, the reason why I'm changing sign is that I want to use yeah this uh, I mean, in so in symplectic topology there is always this big problem of signs, which eventually comes from the fact that uh, I mean uh, there are two different traditions: the one coming from uh, from mechanics where one has some choices, and the one coming from uh, complex geometry when one has other choices. And these choices, uh, there's nothing you can do. These choices are not compatible. So one has to choose uh, what one prefers. I come more from mechanics, so I, I stick with this. Uh, so for me, omega is dp dq. And so if you want that the Hamiltonian equation, so the integral lines of these vector fields are the classical ones, uh, q dot equal the derivative of h with respect to p, and p dot equal minus the derivative so on, then these are the, the correct uh, definition. Okay, so this is a defined uh, 
a vector field, and so this defines uh, yeah, an ODE. So one gets ODE first order on t star m. This is one thing, Hamiltonian system. And the other side of the story is that instead the Lagrangian L defines uh, the Euler Lagrange equation. Let me write them in local coordinates ddt uh, dvl t q q dot equals d q l t q q dot. These are called, let's write them el. These are the Euler Lagrange equations defined by the Lagrangian L. And um, uh, this is a, 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 system, a second order system. It's a system of s equations of second order. There is a, here there is Q dot, but then we derive another times in, in T. And, uh, and the, the connection between these two is that, uh, so X of T equal Q T P T is an integral line in an integral line of the vector field xh if and only if q, its projection on the base, is a solution of the Euler-Lagrange equation. Okay? And yeah, maybe the last thing I should add is that the Tonelli assumptions are involutive. If H is Tonelli, then also, let me write it here, H Tonelli implies that L is Tonelli, which means that L satisfies exactly the same assumptions but where these are derivatives with respect to V, where you just replace uh, P with V. So it's, again, strictly convex and superlinear. And then, actually, if you apply the Fenchel transform twice, you come back to H. OK. This, I think, is what I wanted to say about, uh, about this, uh, this duality. OK, so we have these two different languages of looking at the same system. First order with the Hamiltonian H, or second order with the Lagrangian L. So the next object we need are now the action functionals. And also here, we have two ac action functionals, the one coming from the Hamiltonian side and the one coming from the Lagrangian side. Let's write them. piece of notation. If W is a manifold, when I write lambda W, I mean uh, the space of loops, smooth loops with values so parameterized on the, uh, between 0 and 1 uh, with value in W, Okay, the free loop space of, uh, of W. And now, so on uh, Lambda t star m, we have the, the Hamiltonian action functional. Action functional. So this is just, let's call it A, A h, it's induced by Hamiltonian h, x now is a loop. So we integrate, so now we have a one form, lambda. So we integrate the form lambda over x. 
and then we subtract h t x t dt. So this is exactly the same functional we saw we saw this morning because in this case the form is exact, so we don't need it to fill and to integrate omega. We can uh, immediately integrate lambda. And again, there's, it's actually minus the functional we saw this morning, again, by physical tradition. This is the, the standard uh, Hamiltonian action for a physicist. So this is the uh, Hamiltonian action functional and its critical points. So x is a critical point AH if and only if X is a one periodic orbit of XH. So this functional singles out the one periodic solutions of our system, where again, one periodic means just one is not the minimal period. Maybe this, this is, uh, has period uh, one over 17, okay? Okay, so this is the Hamiltonian side. And the, the Lagrangian side, we have another functional, which is now defined, let's call it S, L. This is defined on loops in M, with values of L in R. And this is the usual Lagrangian action function. So S, L of Q, now Q is a, is a loop in M, is the integral on T of L, T, Q of t, Q prime of t. And, uh, and again, Q is a critical point of SL if and only if Q is a one periodic solution of the Euler-Lagrange equations associated to L. Okay, so we have these two action functionals. So this is called, uh, let's call it the Lagrangian action functional. And uh, the first thing we want to do today is to understand a bit the relationship between these two functionals. In some sense, they see the same critical points because we said that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between, well, between all solutions, and so in particular between periodic solutions of the vector field XH and between one periodic solution of the Euler-Lagrange equation. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between critical points, but we want to understand more about the relationship between these two functionals. Well, the first observation is that this is a nice functional. We will see it a bit later. So, mark SL is nice. By this I mean, for instance, it's bounded from below. Because L is, since it was superlinear, L is bounded from below. So, for theory, Actually, its critical point have uh, finite Morse index. So finite Morse index. And then we will see, in, say, nice compactness properties. Compactness. We will see it later what this means, properties. And this is actually, this is the functional which uh, uh, even Tonelli used to prove, uh, I don't know, existence of uh, minimizers connecting to points, or also uh, actually the, the study of this functional motivates the name Tonelli Hamiltonians or Tonelli Lagrangians. And uh, instead, this AH is not so nice. Not so nice. For instance, this is unbounded. from above and below, above and below. And critical points have uh, infinite Morse index, infinite Morse index, and co-index. So 
infinitely many positive eigenvalues and negative eigenvalues. Ah, these nice compactness properties I'll uh, explain later. It's the palais mail condition, but th this will come out later. Yes, yes. And, uh, and again, because here, the, the reason is just here, so a functional, uh, the behavior of, the, of a function is always driven by the component concerning the higher order derivatives. Here the higher order derivatives appear here, and the function is actually convex in this variable, and so that's nice. Here the higher order derivatives appear here, and this form, this is a, a bilinear form which is in, in, indefinite. It has a, an infinite dimensional positive eigenspace and an infinite dimensional negative eigenspace, and that's bad. Uh, but a nice thing, so th the first connection between these two functionals is this one, that the, so the critical values instead are the same. That's, so if x is a critical point of a h, and say it's of the form q p, then a h x equals s l q. This you can, you, you just write uh, this, you use a Legend duality and you immediately get this, uh, this identity. So critical levels are, are the same. So in particular, critical values of AH are bounded from below. So critical values of AH are bounded from below. Although, so AH is not bounded from below, but its critical values are, because they coincide with the critical values of S, and that's bounded from below everywhere. Okay, now we want to understand a bit more about the relationship between these two functionals, and let's do like this. Let's consider this map here, I'll call it theta. This will be a diffeo between uh, the loop space of Tm and the loop space of T star m. Okay? I want to build now a diffeomorphism between these two, say, infinite dimensional manifolds. Free loops in Tm and free loops in T star m. And I will define it by using the, the Legendre transform, but with a, with a shift. So, so here a loop is something of the form uh, QV, and this will be mapped, so this remains in Q, and here I have to write uh, covectors, and covector, the natural choice is to put DVL, so let's put a dot, dot Q, and here instead of writing just V, I write V plus Q prime. Okay, which makes sense because also Q prime, the derivative in time is a, is a vector. So if you look at this map uh, for a moment, you realize that this is a, so this is a diffeo between these two infinite dimensional manifolds. It preserves, it's fiber, fiber preserving. Meaning that, so th actually these, these manifold here, they both have the structure, so lambda Tm is also a vector bundle over lambda M and the same lambda of T star M. It also vibrates here, okay? You just forget about the, the top part and you just project down. And this map theta commutes with these, uh, with these projectors, of course. And now let's look at, so our action function, the Hamiltonian action function is defined here. But let's use this map to see the same functional. Let's read it here. Okay, this is what I want to do. So now I want to use maybe this blackboard to do this computation 
I want to compute the action h of theta of some q v. Okay? So I want to take uh, the Hamilton action function, which is defined here, and read it through this diffeomorphism, read it here, see what it, what it looks like. So let's see. So here I have to write, so first of all, I have to write, uh, so this is theta, I have to write uh, pq dot. And where p is this one, so p is dv l tq v plus q prime. And this has to apply to q dot. This is pq dot minus the Hamiltonian term h of t q. And again, here I have to write p. And p is again the same dv l with the same arguments. Okay. Now let's write the, well, we can write h in terms of the Legend Le duality. So I just copy again this term here, dvl t q v plus q dot e q dot minus. So here I have to so uh, and here I use uh, Legend duality, but I have to remember that here the p here is this one dvl in t q v plus q dot. Okay, so here I get the p is exactly dvl t q v plus q dot, and this has to be applied to v plus q dot. Then minus, which makes a plus, L of T Q V plus Q dot. Okay? DT. Here I apply Legendre duality. Let's see if I didn't do any mistake. Okay. And then, so here there is a small. Uh, Simplification, the term with q dot and the term with q dot cancels. So there is just this term here. DVL T Q V plus Q prime. And this is just multiplied, applied to V with a minus sign in front. It comes from here, the term with q dot cancels. And then there is a plus L T Q V plus Q prime D T. And then the next thing to do is to look at this term. This looks a bit like uh, the first term in a in a Taylor in a Taylor expansion. So let's uh, continue here. I want actually, yes, to, well, I, I want to use uh, so Taylor formula well, with integral reminder. Let, let me write down the formula that I want to use now. Like f of u equals f of 0 plus f prime 0 at q, and then plus, say, u squared integral from 0 to 1, uh, f second of s u times 1 minus s ds. Okay? So this is Taylor formula with integral reminder uh, first order. I want to use this formula. 
and I want to apply it to the function f of r. Uh, this is L of t, q, q prime plus 1 minus r, v. I want to apply to this function here, where and u equal 1. Okay? If you just apply this formula, this Taylor formula to this uh, real valued function of one variable f of r, what you get, I'll write immediately the, the result, and you can check the, what you get is this, that L of t q q prime equals L of t q q prime plus v minus dvl t q q prime plus v applied to v and then there is plus this integral reminder so there is integral from 0 to 1 s dvvl t q q prime plus s v and this is applied to v v it's a second it's a second uh, derivative and it's an integral in ds okay that's what you get and then if you if you plug in If you plug in this formula in this, uh, in this expression here, I again will write the result. What you get is that AH of this theta QV is the integral on T of L T Q Q dot dt minus a double integral, integral on t and integral on 0, 1 of s dvvl t q q prime plus sv applied to v v and there is a ds and there is a dt. Okay, so. And so now we can look a bit what we found. So here we found exactly the, the Lagrangian action function applied to Q. There is no more V. And here, let's call this function, let's write minus U of QV. Where U of QV is this function here. Okay, so what, what does this uh, Hamiltonian functional look like? It's exactly this uh, Lagrangian action function S minus this term here. Now, remember, L was uh, strictly convex. So this, this is always positive. So this U is always greater or equal than zero. And actually, it vanishes only U of QV is zero if and only if v is zero. Because, uh, because yeah, the dependence of v is here. When v is not zero, then this integral cannot vanish. Okay? So we are, this Hamiltonian action functional, seen instead of looking at it here, if we look at it on the, uh, on the loop space of the tangent bundle, it's really, so on the zero section of this loop space of the tangent bundle, it's uh, the good old uh, Lagrangian action functional. And then there is minus just a function, so there is this function u which just grows on the fibers. And actually you can check easily, this I'll, I won't check it now, but this is also very easy. 
that uh, uh, so the the differential with respect to v of u of q v so the fiber wise differential of this uh, u is zero if and only if v equals zero so the situation is exactly that on this fire on the fibers the we are subtracting a function which is positive going up and uh, its restriction on each fiber has no critical points okay so from this expression it's 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 quite clear that the the two Morse theory of the Hamiltonian and the Lagrangian action function must be the same because uh, on one side yeah I mean, if, if we just look at the Hamiltonian action function but we on these funny funny coordinates what we get is on the zero section we get our old uh, Lagrangian action function and then we have a lot of other direction actually infinitely many other direction because this is a vector bundle with infinite dimensional fibers but on which the the function is completely trivial it goes down so this is the what originates uh, uh, negative uh, infinite Morse uh, Morse index but from the point of view of uh, Morse theory these two functional should be exactly uh, the same and so the purpose of the next talks will be to make this initial observation more formal and see how we can use this observation to relate uh, fleur homology and Morse homology for S but let me derive some consequences from this People who are a bit familiar with uh, algebraic topology could also recognize that in this construction it's a, it's a bit similar to the uh, when you do uh, the Tom when you want to represent via Morse homology the Tom isomorphism of a vector bundle, but in this in this strange situation where our vector bundle actually has an infinite dimensional fiber you would actually use a function of this form, some given Morse function on the base minus a coercive function on the fiber. Okay, so I wanted to derive some consequences. Well, the first consequence is it's a trivial one, we basically already said it, if I take AH composed to theta and they're restricted to the zero section of lambda tm what we get is precisely s so we find again that the critical points are in one-to-one -one correspondence and so on another consequence is this inequality that if I take the Hamiltonian action of any loop QP this is always less or equal than the Lagrangian action of just Q and equality holds if and only if well if and only if uh, uh, P and Q dot are related by Legend duality so if and only if P equals d v l t q q dot or equivalently if and only if q dot equal d p h t q p okay so in particular at critical points but not only at critical points so this equality holds when, say, half of the Hamiltonian equation are satisfied. You don't need both of them. You just need half of them. Q dot equal D pH. And then you get equality. OK, so this is an important, or oh, actu actually, this inequality here, you, you don't need this computation. You could derive it immediately from the properties of the Legendre, Legendre transform. It's actually easier. But then it also follows. Uh, quite easily from this uh, from this identity 
And let me also write down, because I will use it tomorrow, say a differential version of this inequality. If you take now, if x equals qp is a critical point for ah, then if I compute this, the second differential of ah at x along, I don't know, variation xi, xi, this is always less or equal than the second differential of s at q. And these, so these are, these are paths of uh, vectors which are tangent to the cotangent bundle. So here I have to uh, map them into like p star, p star xi, p star xi, where pi is again the map going from the cotangent bundle to m, it's a fiber, and this is the differential of this map, okay? And this, this follows uh, easily from this fact uh, and the fact that at critical points these two things vanishes. So you have two functionals. These two fun if, 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 if two functionals are related by an in inequality, at a critical point they coincide, then their di second differential must be ordered in this way. It's just this observation. Okay, but this will be an important inequality in this sequence. Okay, so this describes the, the relationship between the, the Hamiltonian and the La, Lagrangian action functional. And so what we have to do now is to start uh, building a Morse theory for, actually we need it for both of them. And uh, for the Hamiltonian action functional, I will use a lot um, uh, what Mihai and, uh, and Alex are doing, so maybe I'll do it uh, I'll do it tomorrow, but let's start instead with the Lagrangian, Lagrangian action function, so that I can see, for instance, how much Alex yeah, does tomorrow. Okay. So the final topic of today is Morse theory for the Lagrangian action function. So I said that this SL is a nice functional, so it should be easy to do more theory with this functional. Well, to do more theory, for now, we define everything on this space of smooth loops, which is not really a good space to do critical point of theory. What one needs is to work usually in a Banach setting or even better in a Hilbert setting. So in this case, uh, the natural setting will be a an infinite dimensional manifold which is modal on a Hilbert space. This would be optimal. And so we have to choose this Hilbert space. And there's always uh, this uh, sort of balancing, uh, like, like when you do the, I don't know, when you want to minimize a functional, when you, like in, when you do a first class in calculus of variation, you learn that if you want to minimize a functional, you should look for a function space where your functional is at the same time lower semi-continuous, and this imposes, says that the topology should be rich enough, but also coercive, so compact sublevels. And this one requires the topology instead to be weak enough. And if you can uh, balance these two things, have both things at the same time, then you can minimize, you find a minimizer. And in critical point theory, it's a bit the same. You want to have a, a, a structure, a, a, a function space in the space, like a space of curves, which is um, good enough so that your functional is, uh, say, at least C1, continuously differentiable, better if it's smooth. But on the other hand, and this you could do, obtain, I mean, if I choose, for instance, any space of uh, 
functions, for instance, C1 function, C2 function, sobolet spaces with very high order differentiability, this would be fine. But then instead, you want also some compactness. And we will see this compactness here plays the role of the palace male convergence of palace male sequences. And this instead will require the topology of your uh, function space to be instead uh, weak. So we have to balance these two things. And it's it's probably hopeless to do it for the class, for the general class of all Tonelli, Tonelli Lagrangians. So we will strict restrict to uh, a narrower class of Lagrangians, and we will use the standard setting as also for let's say Morse theory for geodesics. So our functional will be the so our manifold will be the space, let's call it H1 from T values in M. So Sobolev class, this H1 is Sobolev class. So these are loops from T to M, such that Q is absolutely continuous. And uh, so in particular, it's differentiable everywhere. And the integral of Q prime squared is finite with respect to any norm. Uh, this is independent on the on the Riemannian metric. Okay, so this is our space of uh, of loops, and this is a nice uh, Hilbert manifold. Meaning that so it's an infinite has the structure of an infinite dimensional manifold modeled on a on a Hilbert space. And l let me just write a useful chart because we it's the chart that one then uses when if one wants to make computations. If you want to define charts here, what you can do is uh, fix, uh, so le let's fix some, let's uh, call it Q0, a smooth loop. And for simplicity, let's also assume that Q0 preserves the orientation. In, uh, I mean, maybe if M is orientable, this is a void assumption. If, if it's not, uh, instead it's, it's, use, it's useful. Okay, and then you can do the following. You can sort of take uh, like a chart, a moving chart which follows this Q naught. More precisely, you can find so find a map, smooth map. Let's call it phi from T cross the unit ball, this is the unit ball in Rn, into M, which maps phi of T0 goes into this Q0 of T. And for every T, the map phi T dot, this is a diffio, a diffio onto its image, okay? So in other words, we have this uh, Q0, and we are just taking a moving chart. You can define easily these uh, maps, uh, maps here. And then what you can simply do, now you can take uh, H1 loops, but with values in, the, in this ball. So now, now we can build, uh, so, chart, let's call it phi star. This goes from H1 loops from T to this ball. And this is an I, now, this is an open set. This is containing H1 from T to Rn, and it's open. So this is an open set in a Hilbert space. And then you can just go into our H1 of T M just by composition. So phi star of a loop uh, xi at t is phi t xi of t. Okay. Yes. Ah, uh, if you want that uh, q0 star of tm is trivial, orientable maybe. Same as trivial. 
okay? I don't want, because otherwise uh, you, you will not be able to find such a map, of course. And then you have to use sp a space of sections. Uh, you cannot work with RN, but you have a non-trivial, just because of this. So. Okay, so these are, these are charts. And so with, this is the way how you prove that this is a Hilbert manifold. And let me just uh, put a remark, and this will also be useful, that the domain of, well, actually, these are inverse of charts. Charts usually go from open setting of your manifold into the Hilbert space. These are the inverse of charts. So inverse of, of chart. The remark is just that the, the domain of these charts are C0 open. The domain of these charts are C0 open. So although this is a manifold with a finer topology, H1 is better than C0, uh, it's useful to know that these domains of charts are big, are not only H1 open, but also C0 open. This is, uh, this will be useful. Okay. And uh, so, okay, this is our um, Hilbert manifold <coughs> setting. And then the good Hamiltonians to work with these Hilbert manifold settings are, say, L is, set, so L is Tonelli. So Tonelli, Lagrangian, L is said to be, uh, say, quadratic at infinity. If, so we pose a little bit more, we want uh, this uh, uniform convexity to be a bit more uniform, so DVVL to be greater than some constants times the identity. So we don't want this diff second differential to go to zero when v goes to infinity, where this is a positive constant. And then we want to have some quadratic bounds, like uh, d, b, v, l. This should be less than a constant, l1, d, v, q, l, t, q, v. This should be less or equal than a constant, 1 plus norm of v, and d, v, v, l, t, q, v, less than a constant, 1 plus norm of v squared. OK, whatever. Um, these powers are exactly those which are invariant, because these are expressed in terms of coordinates, because I take these uh, derivatives, but these powers make this condition invariant with respect to change of coordinates. So, for instance, the classical, say, electromagnetic Lagrangian. So an electromagnetic Lagrangian is something, let's say, LTQV. So there is a Riemannian metric, so one half v squared. Maybe the Riemannian metric depends on t. Let's put a t. Then there is uh, maybe a, a magnetic uh, term, so a one form, alpha in q applied to v. This is a one form. Maybe this also depends on t. Let's put it here. And then there is a potential, minus v of q. Maybe this also depends on t. OK? This is a. This is exactly quadratic, and this instead has only a quadratic growth. Yeah? Yes? This one? Here, this, it's the mixed derivative V and Q. And here is VV. And here is, ah, sorry. You are perfectly right. This is dqq. dvv, dvq, dqq. Sorry, yeah, thanks. Uh, 
Okay. Yeah, if you play with change of coordinates, you see that these are the invariant, these are an invariant class of things. And this is satisfied by these electromagnetic Lagrangians. Okay, and uh, now let me state it as a lemma that one can prove. Uh, so under this assumption, so this is a more restricted class than just Tonelli, but it's, uh, it, it fits nicely with this uh, H1 uh, setting. And the precise statement is that, so if L is quadratic at infinity, then, so, well, this function SL is, uh, uh, so it's C11. So it's continuously differentiable and its differential is locally Lipschitz. And uh, actually SL is twice Gato differentiable. When you have functions of several variables, and here there are infinitely many, you have always the difference between differentiability, which means that you approximate uh, with your di differential uniform in every direction, and instead directional derivatives. This is Gateau differentiability. And this is not twice differentiable in the usual sense, but only direction-wise. That's uh, it's twice ghetto differential and uh, say this second differential at any q has finite Morse index and also finite nullity, meaning that the kernel the kernel is finite dimensional and then negative angle space is also finite dimensional. And this is about all you can say in the general case. If moreover L is electromagnetic then SL is smooth. Okay, so this function in general is not smooth. Actually, it's not even C2. Actually, you could also prove that if SL is uh, twice differentiable, then L has to be electromagnetic, has to be exactly quadratic. In, uh, so this, uh, yeah, okay. So, but, so it, it's a reasonable function to expect a Morse theory. Of course, if it's just C11, one has some technical problems. Uh, but at least in this uh, electromagnetic uh, case, you don't have those technical problems. And the last thing I want to discuss today is why, well, so on one side, this space is nice because uh, the function is uh, reasonably regular. And then I said that there is the other side the function should have good compactness. So let's discuss the compactness. And as I said, so let me give the definition. Um, I should also say a little bit more. This H1 TM, I said it's a Hilbert, it's a Hilbert manifold. Not only, it also has, has natural complete Riemannian matrix. Which I just write it here. So if I take two, so th these are two tangent vectors at Q, H1, Tm, and I want to compute their scalar product. So Q is a loop. And so these are uh, vector, uh, vector fields along Q. And what you do is uh, you take the integral on T, you take your any Riemannian metric G on M, G 
is a Riemannian metric here. And here we compute, well, the covariant derivative psi psi. This is the de de covariant derivative along Q. And then you write G of psi eta. So it's, it's the nonlinear version of the uh, H1 scalar product, so product of the derivatives times L2. Okay, and you can prove that this uh, this uh, defines a Riemannian metric on uh, on this space, and which is actually complete. It's a complete metric space with induced distance, so it's very nice. And now, when you have uh, so in general, if I have a function, say a C1 function onto a, some, some manifold with a, with a Riemannian metric. A sequence of points, let's call them Xn, contained in M, is said to be, is a palismail sequence. If the value of the function along this sequence converges to some value. And the differential of f, if we consider its norm, which is induced by the Riemannian metric that you had here, this goes to 0. Okay, This is a palace main sequence. So for instance, a, critical, a sequence of critical points converging to a certain level, it's a palace main sequence. And uh, F is said to satisfy the palismail condition if every palismail sequence is compact, so has a converging subsequence. So what is this good for? I'll show you just with a, a picture. Uh, so let's say that this is some level f equals c. So when you do critical point theory, what you would like to do is to use the gradient flow of your function to deform sublevels. You want to start from a sublevel, you want to use the gradient flow, the negative gradient flow, to deform a sublevel. What is an, an obstruction to do this? An obstruction is that if you have some flow line, say this is a solution of u prime equal minus gradient of f of u. If I have a flow line like this, which goes to infinity, but the value of the function remains bounded uh, from below. So it's like there is a critical point at infinity which is never reached. So even if there are no critical points, we, we, if you have such a function, you cannot use the gradient flow to deform, to send the point which is here. So this is the space where f is bigger than c, and here is f less than c. You cannot use the gradient flow to m map a point here down to here. But if you see what happens is that here, if this does like this, uh, so it means that the gradient is not pushing down good enough for so it means that there must be a palismail sequence. This, this differential, there must be a sequence here going to infinity, which is a palismail sequence. Because if, on the contrary, this differential here is bounded away from zero, then the gradient will be strong enough and will push everything down. Okay? This is the meaning of the palismail condition. And uh, the last thing I want to do today in the last five minutes is to prove, or at least sketch the proof of the fact that uh, uh, this functional satisfies the Palais-Mail condition. So the lemma. is if L is quadratic at infinity, then SL satisfies 
the palace mill condition. Okay? And then this will make this a function which is, can be studied with the methods of critical point theory, and then we will be able to define a Morse theory for this function. So how does the proof go? So we have to start with a sequence, let's call it you know, QH. This is a sequence in our H1 with values in M. And it's a palace mill sequence. Well, first of all, we use the fact that SL of QH is bounded from above. Well, it's converging, so in particular, it's bounded from above. And this, since uh, uh, we said that this L grows at least quadratically, the, the fact that the second, uh, the second differential is bounded away from zero, it's strictly positive, it means that L must grow at least quadratically. So this uh, implies that the QH prime squared, this integral here, this is bounded from above also, okay? Because you can bound this from above with this. First thing. Now, this together with the cauchy schwarz inequality implies, uh, what does it imply? So if I computed the distance between QH of, uh, I don't know, T1 minus with QH of T0, take these two points. This distance can be bounded by, of course, QH is one path going from here to here, so I can bound it from integral T1, T0 T of QH prime S, yes. And here I can use Cauchy-Schwarz. So T1 minus T0, one half, and here I have QH prime squared, and I can also integrate on the whole thing, say one half. So this is Cauchy-Schwarz. And so this tells us that uh, uh, QH is equi one half holder. Okay. So by uh, Ascoli-Arzela theorem, Ascoli um, so well, these Q are valued in a compact manifold, so equiboundness is not a problem, and equicontinuity is given with this. So we know that QH up to a subsequence, so again, uh, up to subsequence, QH converges to some Q, which is in C0 for now of Tm, uniformly. And now the point is that we want to strengthen this convergence because we want this sequence to be compact but in the natural uh, topology of our space. So we want this convergence not to be just C0 but to be H1, in the Sobolev space H1. But the good thing is that we said that the charts of our coordinate system are, the domain of the charts are C0 open. So since this convergence is zero, it will eventually enter in a domain of a chart. So in particular, QH enters eventually in a domain of a chart, and this means that we can actually now work locally. We don't have to worry about manifolds. We can think that everything is now is uh, valued in Rn. So we can consider Lagrangians on Rn. So we can work locally. So we can uh, we can assume let me assume that M, for instance, now is the say the unit ball in a ren. Okay? And now, and now remember, we also have this. 
So QH, so now QH is contained in H1 now with values in Rn and it's bounded. But this is a Hilbert space. So bounded sequence up to a subsequence, they converge weakly. So we already had a uniform limit. So this must be also a weak limit. So this tells us two things. It tells us that this limit, this Q is not just continuous, but it's also C1, H1. So this tells that Q is in H1. And the convergence QH to Q is not only uniform, but it's stronger than this. It's weak H1. Okay, so now the last step we, we have to pass from the weak convergence to the strong convergence. This is the last thing we need, uh, we need to prove. And this is where now using the, Hil I mean, the affine structure of Rn turns out to be useful. So what do we know? We know that if I compute the differential of SL, we still haven't used this assumption. We still haven't used that this differential goes to zero. So, if this, so this goes to zero in norm. This goes to zero strongly in the dual of our Hilbert space. So it, it means that if I evaluate onto a bounded sequence, for instance, this sequence here, which is bounded, this is going to zero strongly. This is bounded, so this goes to zero. This is a sequence of number which goes to zero. So it's an infinitesimal, small o of one. And then we can compute this. So what is, so the action function was the, was the integral of the Lagrangian. When we differentiate, we obtain the differential L with respect to Q, evaluated into two T, QH, QH prime, and this has to be evaluated against QH minus Q plus DVL T QH QH prime, and this has to be evaluated instead about QH prime minus Q prime. So this goes to zero. Now, so the sum goes to zero. But actually, uh, QH minus Q, for instance, goes to zero in L2. Well, it goes to zero weakly in H1, but the embedding of H1 into L2 is compact. So this goes to zero in L2. And uh, this is bounded in L2 because, uh, well, because of the, of the growth assumption of our Lagrangian and because Q was bounded in H1. So actually, this first integral, this is also an infinitesimal. So what we get from this is that this integral is an infinitesimal. And the last step is to uh, so now DVL, and just compute this, DVL T QH, QH prime uh, against QH prime minus Q prime. I want to compare it with something which is slightly better, which is DVL. Here, instead of putting QH prime, I put the value of the limit. T QH Q prime, and this is the same. QH prime minus Q prime. So if I compute this difference, well, this difference, I can express it in the form of an integral. It's an integral from zero to one of I have to differentiate with respect to this last variable. So I have a dvv 
L, T, Q, H, and here I have Q prime plus S, Q, H prime minus Q prime. Evaluated again Q, H prime minus Q prime in DS. And now this is again nice because here, uh, sorry, here it's a second, twice. This is a second differential wants to. This is again our nice thing. This is greater or equal than some constant uh, QH prime minus Q prime squared. Okay? So we have this uh, inequality. And so if we now just take this inequality and we integrate it in time, what we get is L naught integral on T on this uh, QH prime minus Q prime squared is less or equal than this integral in T first term dvl T QH QH prime applied to QH prime minus Q prime minus dvl T QH Q prime QH prime minus Q prime and now we just look at this so one of these term is exactly this one namely this one so this term here is infinitesimal because it was written there this comes from the fact that it's a polysmale sequence and this now this is better now this is infinitesimal just because this sequence qh prime minus q prime this is uh, goes to zero say weekly l2 because uh, qh was going to q weekly h1 when we derive we obtain weak l2 and this uh, is compact in l2 again by using the assumption again and all these it, it's all a big application of dominating convergence eventually so this is again an infinitesimal and so we finally get that uh, QH prime converges to Q prime in L2. So we finally get that QH converges to Q in H1, which is what we wanted to get. We get the, the compactness, OK? So I wanted to show this proof because at least here one sees how the hypothesis match, the quadratic hypothesis match to with our choice of a, of a function space. This is the function space where our function satisfy Pali's mail. And then the program for tomorrow is to uh, describe a bit the, this will be simple, the Morse homology of this function, and then to start uh, relating it to the Fleur homology instead of the Hamilton action function. I'll stop here, thank you.